You're listening to Fire Ecology Chats, a podcast series by the Association for Fire Ecology. Welcome, everybody. My name is Bob Keen. I'm the editor of the journal Fire Ecology that is sponsored by the Association of Fire Ecologists. And today we have two wonderful guests on a very exciting paper that is on a field that is not very studied very much, but is incredibly important. Uh, Today we have, uh, the paper is predicting wildfire impacts on the prehistoric archeological record of the Jemez Mountains in New Mexico, USA. And the two people that are gonna talk about it are Megan Friggins and Rachel Lohman. I'll have you introduce yourself, Megan. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Friggins. I'm a research ecologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, um, and I work out of Albuquerque, though I work uh, in many different areas of the Western U.S. And Rachel? Thanks, Bob. Um, Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Lohman. I'm a research landscape ecologist with the uh, USGS, and I also live in Albuquerque. I work in the Jemez Mountains in New Mexico, um, but also in, in Alaska. Well, welcome you two, and thank you for taking your time to answer these questions on this very important paper. Uh, Megan, can you uh, give us the quick uh, rundown on what the paper is about? This paper is about trying to uh, develop some models to predict how environmental conditions can impact or or influence our observations of fire effects on archaeological sites within the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico. So, Archaeological records are really important, but they're also finite um, resources in our landscapes. There's areas within the U.S. that have a large number of these sites. And so it can be a huge task um, to try to survey these sites. And this this task of surveying and gathering information before it's lost becomes quite urgent when you're dealing with fire prone landscapes, uh, given that fires can impact those records. And so This uh, analysis that's described in the paper is actually just part of a larger project that Rachel was managing um, that was funded from the Joint Fire Science uh, Project. And it looks at uh, how well we can use remotely sensed and spatially uh, derived predictors of landscape conditions uh, to predict fire effects and fire severity on archaeological sites in the Jemez Mountains. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Rachel, can you tell us about that larger study? What, how, how does that uh, mesh with this current study? Some years ago, a joint fire science program recognized that fire effects on cultural resources on the, the record of people who lived um, in the past was a topic of increasing importance. Land managers and archaeologists were, were having to manage Um, these cultural resources on landscapes that are progressively more fire prone um, using management tactics that, you know, maybe are um, having to be progressively more intensive. And there wasn't a lot of information on how fire effects or how fuel treatments and prescribed fire um, affect these cultural resources. So one question uh, had to do with how much of the landscape had to be treated, how intensively archaeological sites needed to be treated and then if or when wildfires burn or when prescribed fires burn across these sites what the effects are to the individual artifacts on the site pieces of pottery um, uh, the architectural remains um, that are on sites or stone tools you know what those effects are and then how we might mitigate any unwanted effects the the types of effects that um, destroy or compromise the record so Joint Fire Science Program funded a project that we call ArcBurn, which was or is, it's an ongoing project even beyond the funding, which is aimed at providing fire managers, archaeologists, and the research community with information, tools, data, knowledge on the relationship of fire and cultural resources. And one important part of that relationship is how fires interacted with cultural landscapes of the past. So Um, In the Southwest, the fires that burned in the past were not as uh, severe. And so some of these resources have been exposed to fires over and over again, but it's not until the past hundred or so years that those fires were damaging. Um, So that's one element of the project. Another is on fire management 
and fire behavior and its effects on um, on these resources. But the sum goal is to protect and preserve this uh, non-renewable record for you know as long as we can on these um, on these really unique and important landscapes. Geez, what a wonderful study! So uh, let's get back to this particular paper. Uh, Megan, tell us what did you find? What where are where are the highest impacts of wildfire on these archaeological records? Well, uh, what we did for this analysis is we used a machine learning algorithm and specifically the random forest uh, software program to look at the relationship between uh, observed fire effects on archaeological artifacts and features at a site, as well as the observed fire severity at the site. Um, and relating that to a variety of topographic and climate variables. And so uh, there's essentially two components to this analysis. One, uh, do we observe a fire effect at all? And then the second is what was observed fire severity at a particular site. And so what we found is that um, both topology and uh, climate were important predictors of whether we observed either of those types of fire impacts. Uh, for the most part though, we found that climate variables were more important for predicting observed fire impacts um, within these archeological sites. And it was more of a combination for uh, different levels of observed fire severity. Oh, okay. So uh, Rachel, uh, as you know, I've studied fuels for um, nearly all my career, and I was wondering, of course, you didn't include fuels in your uh, random forest analysis, but how important do you think fuels are to the protection or the damage to these archaeological resources? Yeah, so we, we did include um, some fuel variables at a very um, coarse scale relative to the fuels. Um, that you studied, Bob, and that we know are really important um, in fire effects. So we, we included fuels as fuel models, so fuel loading models, um, the Scott and Bergen 40 fuel models, and then some vegetation variables that uh, were meant to reflect both uh, you know, the ecological setting in which these sites occurred, but then also the, the amount of biomass that surrounded them. But that's not the same as incorporating um, the individual sticks that essentially contact these resources and cause damage at the, at the artifact level. And so, um, so it is really important to incorporate fuels and as fine, um, a, as fine a method as possible for understanding fire effects for everything, for, for animals, for plants, for cultural resources. But we have to weigh that with the sort of the applicability and the generalizability of the model that we were trying to build. Because one of the things that actually an archeologist just told me on a conversation this morning when I asked her um, what, what one of the most important questions that this type of research could answer is, is that she told me they need a way to predict where sites are that are at the highest risk of damage. And they have to be able to, there has to be a, a method for doing that without mapping um, individual sticks on the ground. So if a tree falls across um, a, a site that has um, a small Pueblo or something on it, a, a dwelling site, um, where that tree burns um, as it contacts uh, pot sherds or stone tools or the walls of that site, there's going to be um, an effect and, and probably a negative, a negative effect from that tree burning. But we don't have a good way now because we don't have precise fuel mapping for, you know, it's sort of the, the individual fuel piece level, although that's coming. We don't have a good way for knowing, you know, where those logs are um, on individual sites. And so what we tried to do is build a model that could be predictive at the landscape scale at which these fuel treatments and restoration treatments are happening. But my, my last caveat is to say that fuels are always important. I mean, without mapping fuels, understanding fuels, understanding the relationship of fuels, fire behavior, and fire effects, you know, we're, we are missing some of the story. And of course, fuels are what are treated to mitigate these um, unwanted impacts. So uh, Megan, you found that the highest severity impacts were on the southern slopes, 
that are steep and have less accumulated uh, surface moisture, does that still hold with a really dry fire year or an extreme fire year? Yes, the results show in general that multiple different variables were important, uh, were associated with higher severity burns at a given site. And those variables, whether they were uh, dealing with topography or climate, tended to indicate sites with drier conditions were more likely to have high severity fires. And so uh, we felt this was important given that some of the future climate projections uh, are saying that this area is going to get drier. So these types of findings, I think, can be significant for how we think about the risks to archeological sites going forward in the future. So it wasn't just uh, particular variables being uh, more important, but often it was the combination of variables and, and the way these algorithms can work, they're looking at multiple uh, conditions, range of values within all the predictor variables that we use at the same time. And so what we found uh, from kind of the big picture perspective across these landscapes is those sites that had drier conditions or a tendency to be drier because of their location were more likely to have those observed uh, higher burn severity. Oh, great. Wonderful. Uh, Rachel, who's going to use this information that from this paper? Who, who, how do you envision this happening? I hope it'll be used in a couple different ways. Number one, on the ground by land managers and archaeologists. Um, I hope this, for, for one thing, gives a common language to um, to fire managers, land managers, and archaeologists. So, you know, for for nearly the first time, we've we've created a, you know a model and an analytical tool and information that unites those worlds that that um, allows people who do fuel treatments and who plan for a prescribed fire to understand in fire terms um, what the impacts are to cultural resources and what the relationship is of you know, these topography, fuels and weather variables are um, to these unwanted impacts. And so I think, you know, my hope is that this is the beginning of, of creating that sort of common language and, and common way of looking at land management that incorporates you know, multiple different types of resources. Second, I hope that archeologists on the ground, and I think archeologists on the ground can use this as a way of triaging sites, even if we haven't gotten to the level of you know, mapping and understanding the, the relationship of individual fuel, fuel pieces or fuel particles to um, archeological fire effects. I think we've provided enough information for archeologists to start to triage those sites that might be of higher priority um, for fuels treatments to mitigate these unwanted effects. We've given them some information um, and coupled with the rest of the arc burn project on which types of artifacts that are present at sites are um, more sensitive to fire effects. And archeologists who work in fire prone environments um, know in general what types of artifacts are more sensitive. And so now we've given them some variables to locate on the landscape, which of their sites they might want to send fuels treatment crews to first, or which you know they might want to be especially mindful of in a prescribed fire or um, in the face of a wildfire. And then I think the, the third thing that we've done is provided the foundation for future modeling um, and analysis at that finer uh, scale in terms of our input variables and in terms of you know maybe some dynamic fuels and vegetation variables. So to be able to say Kind of what you alluded to, Bob, which is, you know, under these contemporary conditions, we have this certain risk. If we increase fuel aridity by 20% across the board, you know, how does that change our picture? Or if we uh, remove all coarse woody debris from sites, how does that change our picture? So I, I think this is, you know, this is really the first project of its kind, and I think it's going to open a lot of doors. Oh, I am sure it will be used. Uh, what a great paper, both of you and your other uh, co-authors uh, who were Connie Constan and Rebecca Neifel. Uh, yeah. I want to thank them as well. Megan, is there anything uh, you, anybody or anything you want to acknowledge before we uh, end this podcast? Uh, yes, I do. You know, at the, at the start of this particular analysis, um, a huge component that that I think is easy to 
to forget about is that there is this wealth of information in these post-fire archaeological assessments and literally thousands of assessments just for the Hamas Mountains that we were dealing with, but I think all across the country as well. And there's a tremendous amount of work that's put into recording a lot of detail of information on these sites. And I believe that this is one of the first efforts to collate that information into a single database and start to analyze um, how that information is recorded, but also to use it in these types of models. And that, that in and of itself has been a really valuable um, outcome, I think, of this analysis, as well as I think something that might be of interest to archaeologists. Oh, absolutely. And I, I want to echo um, what Megan was talking about in terms of the effort um, that goes into the collection of archaeological data. I'm just we, we have this text in the in the acknowledgement section, but I just want to read it here for everyone. Um, we say we gratefully acknowledge archaeologists who document, manage, and protect archaeological sites and who provided data for this research. And that's absolutely true. Thousands and thousands of person hours um, by archaeologists to you know to collect information, to to visit these sites to preserve them as best they can. And I wanna thank them for their patience. The pace of research doesn't always match um, the, the pace of information need, especially when we're talking about topics like climate changes and wildfires. It's my ongoing promise and probably Megan's ongoing promise to, to these colleagues of ours that we continue to try to provide the best information that we can as fast as we can to protect this valuable legacy that doesn't exist in the same manner anywhere else in the world. As I understand it, this was a joint fire science uh, funded program. Uh, you want to tell people where they can find more information about the ArcBurn program? So the best way for people to learn about the ArcBurn project is to send me an email at r-l-o-e-h-m-a-n at usgs.gov. Uh, you can also read about us by Googling ArcBurn, which will take you to the frames website. Um, and we also have a link to the project um, from the Rocky Mountain Research Station website. Well, thank you both of you again. I appreciate your time giving it to Fire Ecology Chats. And I'd just like to end by saying this is Bob Keen chatting about Fire Ecology. Thank you.